Good afternoon. I know, end of the day. Thanks for sticking around. Um, so I'm sure most of you have heard the expression, software eating the world, Mark Andreessen's favorite quote. I'm going to talk to you this afternoon about software eating government. Um, it's a trillion dollar industry that's being eaten 86 days at a time. Why do I say that? That's actually the average sales cycle of our portfolio companies, 86 days, which kind of blows people's minds because they think that selling to government should take like three years. So we'll get into that. But before we do, why don't we take a step back? Let's just talk about government for a moment just to set the stage. So the government in the US, and I'm talking about the federal, state, and local government, employs 22 million people. That's 15% of the entire US workforce. If you think about the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the Dow Jones 30, that's McDonald's, Exxon, Microsoft. If you add up all their employees, that's 6 million employees. So the US government employs roughly three and a half times all of the Dow Jones companies combined. If you think about spend, the US government spends about $7 trillion a year. Add up the market capitalizations of all those companies, it's $5 trillion. Let's add up the market capitalization of companies that we know in the tech space. Apple, Google, Alibaba, Facebook, Amazon. Add them all up. LinkedIn, too. That's $2.4 trillion. So this gives you a sense of the scale that the US government is the single largest company or enterprise in America. There are more than 100,000 government agencies at the local, state, and federal level. So what's GovTech? Let's take a step back and define what we're talking about. So that company, the US government, takes a lot of infrastructure, a lot of tools to do their job. All those departments, all those agencies, they need software and infrastructure to actually do the job of government, run the agencies. And so that's what GovTech is. It's that infrastructure that helps them manage those internal operations and then deliver services to citizens. We like to think of GovTech as the operating system of government, if you think of it that way. And so there are literally thousands of examples. I just put down a few here to give you some context. Things like procurement, law enforcement software, tax collection. They deal with pension liabilities, health care, issuing bonds. All those kinds of activities of the US government require tools and software to actually let that stuff happen. In contrast, think about the, this term civic tech, which you may have read about and heard about. We think of that as the operating system of the citizen, the kinds of tools that citizens use to become better citizens. And so those might be tools that enable community organizing or petitions or advocacy or connecting with your elected official or elections. Those are really important um, aspects of our society, but those are civic tech. So we focus on the gov tech side of this equation. Let's step back for a second and just talk about the scale, again, of this opportunity and, the, and what we're talking about here. The US government, again, local, state, and federal, spends $175 billion a year on GovTech. For, for context, the entire online advertising space is roughly $130 billion this year. Just gives you a sense of the scale. Globally, it's a trillion dollars a year that is being spent on this uh, infrastructure to run governments around the world. You've all read the headlines, so things like healthcare.gov costing $800 million to launch a website. Actually, the internal numbers are now in the billions. Uh, the Veterans Affairs, the VA department here in the US that manages um, services for veterans, uh, taking years to work on a scheduling system, and then after many, many years and hundreds of millions of dollars, they end up with nothing. Um, California recently had a payroll project that spent 50 million bucks and nothing to show for it. And so why is this happening? Because historically, it took two and three and four years to sell into governments. And so startups would not want to stick around that long and sell into these agencies. And in fact, their VCs would tell them, do not go sell to government. And so if you don't have startups selling into government, uh, we make the argument, no startups, no innovation. And if you don't have innovation, what you end up with is literally technology from the 80s and 90s sitting inside of these government agencies. In fact, a good friend of mine just recently became the chief data officer in Los Angeles, and when he showed up for work, literally there was green screen technology on his desk. That looks like the Commodore pet that you might remember from your childhood. So this is what happens when you don't have startups working in your industry. And you end up with government contractors, legacy vendors, who take many, many years to define requirements and build product and then deliver them, and you end up in technology, if it takes you five years to deliver a solution, what has happened in that interim five years in technology? That is a lifetime in our industry. 
So what's changed? Why do we raise a fund? Why did I spend all this time talking to LPs and raising a fund? In the last four or five years, there have been a number of meta trends. I'm listing a few here. Let's talk about a few of them. So first of all, budget constraints. Um, a massive uh, budget constraint wave during the recession, the recent recession, um, has led to uh, government agencies just having very constrained budgets. Uh, not only that, but even now that times are improving in the economy, government agencies are finding themselves with so many more things they need to do with so many less resources, right? And so why that's important is because when a startup that we invest in shows up at a government agency and literally is pricing their product at 100 times less than the existing incumbent, the person on the other side of the desk is listening because they're like, you can do all that for a fraction of what I'm paying? What, tell me more. The cloud. So the emergence of the cloud has had a transformational impact on the enterprise, just in, in corporate America. The cloud has now finally made its way into government. Over 1,000 government agencies in the last year have moved to, for example, Amazon Web Services and GovCloud. Why that's important is because the companies that we are investing in are building their products on the cloud, in the cloud, and when they show up and sell to government agencies, if agencies are not in the cloud, you can't really have that conversation. But now that's all changed. The other dynamic, and the reason this is important, because is, is for those of you who have uh, built cloud companies or invested in, in software as a service companies, you know that adding the next customer onto your built out platform, the marginal cost is actually pretty low. You can keep adding customers and you don't really have that tremendous amount of new expense to service those customers. So what our co companies have been doing with that dynamic is they will literally go to an agency and say, what is your procurement threshold? What is the number below which you do not need to issue an RFP and go through a three year process? And so let's say a medium sized city might be $100,000. What do you think the price is for the product that our companies sell? 99999. Then they go to a very small town and the town says our procurement threshold is $5,000. What do you think the price point is for our companies? $4,999. So you do that over and over and over again, you sell an average $50,000 product times 100,000 agencies, you have yourself a nice little business. Civil, civil servant retirement, cultural. So what's happening now is uh, the workforce within government is aging. So in the next five years, five to 10 years, 25% of all government employees across all 22 million that I talked about are retiring. The IT department in Los Angeles, almost half of their personnel are retiring in the next two years. So this is impactful because the people that are coming in are uh, 20s, 30s, 40 year olds who walk in with an iPad, a Facebook account, a Twitter account, these are modern technologists, they understand what startups are, and when they get to their new job, they don't understand the green screens they're looking at. That's a hugely impactful cultural shift. Open data, you may have read a lot about that or heard of it, we'll just summarize it as the government has a ton of data that is public, data about where sewers are, data on uh, all sorts of activities. The, everything that the government does is actually technically a public data source. It is our government, and so we should be able to see what the budgets are and what personnel get paid and all those kinds of dynamics. Well, governments are taking that open data and making it available, and what, what um, smart entrepreneurs are doing is aggregating that data from hundreds of thousands of these agencies and departments, normalizing the data because it's often disparate and a mess. And when you normalize it, you actually create a really interesting asset that becomes a very valuable business. So what we're seeing is the combination of a number of these trends leading to a multi-decade international cycle of replacing this legacy uh, infrastructure in government with uh, this modern technology. In fact, when I launched the fund in September, nine months ago, I received a number of phone calls from uh, a number of large European governments, uh, Emirates, Asia. A lot of governments are paying attention now to technology because they're realizing that for example, healthcare.gov, you can debate healthcare in this country for 40 years, and then you want to actually implement it, and it comes down to a technology. So it turns out that policy and technology are now integrally related, and, uh, and people are paying attention. So where are we in the timeline? The GovTech um, movement and the startups that we're seeing now, this didn't just come out of you know, thin air. This has been built over the past decade or so. A number of movements have coalesced Everything from the open source movement, Web 2.0 after the dot-com crash. Uh, there was a government, a Gov 2.0 movement sort of in 2008, 2009 that started. 
seminal organizations. Some of you may be familiar with a group called Code for America. They're a phenomenal nonprofit here in the Bay Area, just a few blocks away. And they started this movement a few, four or five years ago, where they would take engineers, uh, create a fellowship program, drop them into government agencies, and actually build apps uh, side by side with the agencies, really just to show what was possible. And so out of that, um, I was actually involved in the launch of the very first GovTech Accelerator. And we literally saw hundreds of companies applying. And we were, we were, we were shocked as to actually how many startups were now uh, attacking this space. So what does the next 10 years look like? Uh, we're seeing, I, I'm literally seeing uh, two, three, five companies a day in my inbox now in this space. I'm, uh, we're, we're seeing thousands of GovTech startups now really being created. You're gonna see, the interesting dynamic at the GovTech space is actually a lot of the innovation we're seeing is happening at the city level. And the reason we're seeing that is because a lot of the pressures I talked about, the budget pressure and those dynamics, if, when the federal agencies cut, it gets pushed down to the state level, it gets pushed down to the local level. So the local level folks are the ones who are really looking for innovations first. And so what's interesting in the GovTech space is it's not happening federal down, it's actually happening grassroots up. That's really, that's really interesting. But we see an expansion there to uh, uh, state and uh, international as well. Two minutes about me and then I'm going to get into the portfolio. I wanted to share some stats about what we're seeing in the portfolio, but I thought it's always nice to introduce yourself if you're chatting. So um, I've, I've, been, I've had the benefit of um, actually being on all sides of the table before I, I launched my own fund. Um, I was part of two startups that exited. Uh, one was in the telecommunications space, which we sold to British Telecom, and then one in the game space, which I, we sold to Rovi. This is back in 2006. I've had the uh, good fortune to be um, an angel investor in a number of startups, mostly enterprise, software as a service. Um, and a number of exited, still in uh, some great companies like PagerDuty, HelloSign, and a few others. I've also had the benefit of being a limited partner in a couple of funds. Uh, Chris Saka, all of his lowercase funds, DAG Ventures, which is a later stage fund. And the reason I bring it up is because if you're gonna attack a new space like GovTech or, or any vertical and you wanna raise a fund, I think it's important to sort of understand the dynamics of being an entrepreneur, an investor, uh, as well as an LP. And I do a lot of work on the nonprofit side. I mentioned Code for America. I'm very involved with that organization. And actually, I launched a school just a few blocks from here, the first ever um, progressive Mandarin immersion school uh, just a few blocks from here, um, preschool and element elementary. All right, enough about me. Uh, to the GovTech fund. So we launched the fund, 23 million, uh, September of last year. As I mentioned, the focus is the uh, exclusively uh, startups that are transforming this trillion dollar um, market. We're a seed series A investor. Um, I've been working in the space for over five years and uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, helped to launch that first ever accelerator. We've made six investments to date and just to give you a quick sense, we've deployed roughly four and a half, five million dollars and had about 40 million dollars uh, co-invested with us or follow on rounds from VCs like General Catalyst, Spark, um, Lowercase Capital. Um, and then there are a bunch of other VCs now that are jumping in the space, not necessarily in deals that we've been in, but Andreessen, Sequoia, and a few others. So the, the market, the, the, the traditional VCs are starting to understand the the massive scale that I talked about, and they're starting to understand the opportunities in the space. Quickly, we made these six investments um, uh, in, in these various areas that uh, I mentioned earlier. So you might say, well, procurement marketplace. Now, why is that sexy? Why would that be interesting at all? Well, uh, it turns out that there is no eBay or Alibaba for government. Why is that important? Well, it turns out that the government spends one to two trillion dollars a year on just stuff, forget about defense, missiles, all that stuff. Just think about like papers, pencils, landscaping, chairs. The US government spends one to two trillion dollars a year on this stuff. There are millions of vendors on one side, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of agencies on the other side, and yet there is no marketplace. How is that possible? This marketplace that we've invested in is today four times larger than Alibaba. Think about that. So that's a huge opportunity. Long-term liability analysis. You'd be thinking, well, that's kind of a snooze fest. Why would you invest in that? It turns out that every government, uh, local, state, and federal, has huge pension problems. In fact, you have cities that are going bankrupt because they can't afford to pay their unfunded pension liabilities. It turns out that a company that's helping to solve a trillion dollar pension fund liability uh, challenge might be an interesting investment. And then I'll last I'll just briefly talk about Mark 43. Law enforcement software. It turns out that our police force today in, in all of our cities across uh, the country are using largely green screen technology. This is very bad if you're trying to track down bad guys because you need the best kind of software, you need to be able to do all your arrest reports, you need to be able to access all the databases about the bad guys, and if none of this talks to each other, you are severely handicapped in your, in your duties to try to enforce the law. Mark 43 is launching their very first customer in August. It is the uh, Washington DC 
Metro DC or DC Metro, 15,000 officers will now be in the cloud, modern technology, as well as Capitol Park Police, the, social, the, uh, the Secret Service, and, uh, and 33 other uh, federal uh, police agencies will be now connected in this, in this um, software. So uh, that gives you a sense of why we have chosen some of these spaces. So what do these companies look like? First of all, they're all built in the cloud, software as a service. We call it B2G, so business to uh, government. So they're selling directly to the government agencies. Proprietary technology and patents, um, they're selling to all levels of uh, government. Maximum one to two quarter sales cycle. As I mentioned earlier, the average sales cycle of our companies is 86 days. None of these three year processes. No regulatory dynamics. I think the previous conversation was just about regulations and so on. There are regulated industries. None of our companies deal with regulatory issues. None of them lobby at government. They're going in and saying, we have a better product than what you're using today, and it's way below the procurement threshold. It's in the cloud. It kicks ass. You should buy this thing. And so that's really how they're selling it, just on the value of what they've made. So if you look at this list and you're an investor, you're probably thinking, well, gee, that sounds a lot like enterprise SaaS that I already invest in. Absolutely right. These companies have built enterprise SaaS products. They just happen to be selling to a, a particular kind of customer that's quite large. So I'll give you a quick example. This is uh, actually a, a, a sales bookings chart from one of my companies. This actually is uh, August 2014. This company has grown 20% compound monthly. That means every single month they're growing 20% more than the month before. This is bookings. This is not cumulative. These are new bookings every single month. They just, uh, in May of this year, they just closed $500,000 of bookings, which was their 20 approximately 20% higher than the previous month. So this gives you a sense of the scale and the velocity of the kinds of things we're seeing in our portfolio. So again, just I'll touch on the velocity piece here. Average sales cycle, 86 days. Actually, that's a typo. That should say CMGR, compound monthly growth rate. We have a couple of companies that are seeing that month in and month out. One of our companies just did what I like to call the double, double, double. So their, Q, their January bookings were the same as all of Q4's bookings. So that just gives you a sense of velocity and compression. I'm not talking like $1,000 here. These are real numbers. March doubled January's bookings, and April doubled March bookings. Gives you a sense of the velocity these guys are seeing. In our portfolio, a company is closing a new deal with an agency every single day. The six companies I just showed you now touch 11,000 agencies, and that's in the last 18 months. We just did a deal, excuse me, one of the companies just did a deal, uh, a $300,000 deal in 14 days, just to give you a sense, right? So hopefully that gives you a sense of what's happening in the space, the scale of the space, and maybe challenges a few of the assumptions you might have about working in government. Um, Follow us at, uh, at GovTech Fund. Uh, my name is Ron Bouganim. I hope that you leave this presentation not only understanding the space, but also understand that when these companies are successful, and they already are being successful, but when they're really successful, uh, not only will they be, I think, tremendous returns for our investors and tremendous investments, but they're actually going to, I think, fundamentally fix the core fabric of government, right, which is a core to our society. So we're really proud of these investments because they're not just great investments, but they're actually investments that matter. So thank you again for the time, and uh, I'll be around if you have any questions afterwards.